Good afternoon, one and all. I hope everybody's well. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Yeah, very well, thanks. Thank you for making the time and turning up. Looking forward to running through the Flux uh, Rapid Risk Assessment today. Give it another couple of minutes um, and then get started. Uh, would somebody please volunteer to scribe? I am slightly indisposed, technically on holiday, but um, just because it's been so difficult to schedule, um, I really wanted to make sure that I was here to, uh, to help with this assessment. Yeah, I can help on scribing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, if you wouldn't mind also putting my name into the document because I'm on mobile, just to add, <laughs> yeah. add some complexity. Um, I think uh, Rowan will uh, will join to share the um, risk assessment document in a moment as well. Um, so I guess while everybody, I'd, so the, the ambition for today is to and, and for some background, Paolo, we ran through the rapid risk assessment document once already um, in order to, we're basically prototyping a new process that's meant to speed up these security assessments. Um, I realized in this case, actually, it's, uh, it's, it's been a bit of a long time schedule, so apologies for that. We've begun the process um, and there was no representative from Flux here. So we'd like to quickly revalidate what we've got already and then try and run through the whole or as much of the document as possible within the hour um, and, and, uh, and, and help to move that security assessment forward. Amazing. That sounds great. Super cool. OK. Um, Rowan, would you mind sharing the uh, risk assessment document, please? Sure. Bear with me one moment. Is that suitable for everybody? Yep. That looks really good for me, thank you. Awesome, okay, thank you, Rowan. So, um, yes, we dropped in, we, we actually went through the threat modeling uh, documentation that was up on, um, that, that was linked uh, on, on the, uh, on the Flux HackMD and, it was useful as a foundation. The, the way that this assessment or the risk assessment is intended to work is that we basically start from a blank canvas and that's so that people who are not familiar with the project, and I think for, for most of us on this call, we understand Flux to some extent, but we're not developers on Flux, for example. So the goal is to basically start with a blank canvas so people can ask or suggest anything that they want and anything um, from my perspective, I might ask a really naive question just to make sure that I understand it correctly um, or something more complex. And it just means that we don't get led by the existing work. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, definitely think that's a great uh, approach to it. One thing that I would say, though, can you just update the, um, the graph there from the latest on the document? Uh, I updated it, uh, predicted it uh, again today. So just to make sure that we have the latest, because uh, there, there are a few things that are a bit more nuanced on, on this version. Cool, thank you. Um, it, if someone could do that in, uh, in parallel, then maybe we can just carry on working through the, uh, the, the first set of questions, which are kind of 
uh, more scopes to you, Paolo, just to help us get, get a baseline. Um, if we can just do some bullet points here, how do people use this project? Uh, I would say at, for GitOps deployments to Kubernetes clusters. Is that a fair one, Lina? Yes, pretty much. So uh, generally it is used to bootstrap clusters and also to manage them going forwards. So in theory would be in, in some cases, the only thing that actually make changes to a cluster. Cool, thank you. Um, and th there's no concept of um, outside of the cluster deployments, I suppose. Uh, obviously, if people are using CRDs to run Terraform or, or Cloud Connect or, or something, but, but there's no specific, it, it's just Kubernetes. As far yeah, as I understand. So, yeah, pretty much. So you can deploy uh, and, and manage multiple clusters or remote clusters as well. And recently we introduced what we call TF controller, which apply Terraform against any sort of uh -huh. infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's a new thing, right? So that's that's quite recent. I uh, will share a link uh, here on the chat. And there's an interesting philosophical question there because well, all software is obviously moving forwards and constantly shipping features generally. When threat modeling, my personal preference, and there is a lot of nuance here, and I'm just expressing my preference, of course, is to choose a point in time, which is the specific release and say, this is what will threat model. So is that uh, in under development or, or is it in a release at this point? Well, it is used in conjunction. It's not use is it's not like part of the core flux but it's used in conjunction with it uh and it's, it's not part of the cncf project it's like a wave uh with works uh addition to flux really cool okay in that case we will not scope it at this point i would suggest That's right. just to try and stay focused um but we'll note that we've specifically excluded it to show that we're aware and we made that decision consciously um, cool. cool. Okay. How does the project work? Um, again, I, I guess reconciling uh, Git state with actual expected Git state with actual state. Uh, is that yes. Uh, I think from a really high level, yes. Uh, but I would just nuance <laughs> the the Git state to a source state. Right, because by default, uh, the built-in flux supports, for example, OCI sources, Helm uh, chart sources, or Helm repositories, right? Uh, buckets, S3 buckets, and also Git repositories. So it's, it's any, it will pretty much reconcile any source state into the actual cluster state. Super cool. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um, very nice. Uh, okay, are there any subcomponents or shared boundaries? So here we might add the TF uh, reconciler. Um, yeah, so that that's an external component. So from the the core components, you would have the source controller, which fetches the sources, and then you have Helm uh, controller and the customized controller, which apply the states into the cluster. Um, then after that you have the notification controller which pretty much like uh, either notifies uh, users about problems or successful reconciliations but it also receives uh, webhook actions uh, from external sources for example to trigger a reconciliation um, and then we have the image controllers the image controllers are two we have an image automation controller and we have an image reflector controller. What they do is pretty much, they check if there is a new tag for a given image. And if there, there is, it will go and update your Git repository with a patch to a new tag. So it will update your YAML files to contain the latest tag of a given image. Nice. And, um... For that notification controller, does that require direct internet routing? Oh, well, sorry, network routing, or is there a concept of a kind of um, webhook forwarder? Just wondering about the network routing. Well, 
pretty much we, we're not um we, we don't prescribe a, a given approach uh, on that so the key thing is the user needs to configure a way for for the request to arrive at that given uh, service we we make available uh, most folks pretty much just open that through the ingress for example if that makes sense yes cool um any other questions from anybody else about these subcomponents cool okay thank you just to highlight a okay, few things do i don't know if it's worth yes, mentioning please. now oh actually yeah it's the next question so yeah you go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay communications protocols so we're thinking about um uh network encryption um maybe i mean everything anything that's protocol yeah all right so uh, let's go components by components right so source controller it mostly goes to those different sources right so it will do ssh connections uh, outbound it will do http and https um, outbound as well and this would be to literally anything right so for the ocis to s3 buckets and and so on it has an inbound uh, endpoint which is to source or well, to serve the artifacts it, it generates currently it only supports http we have an rfc uh, in flight at the minute which is to, to support that building uh, by uh, https So that is that. So when we go to Helm controller and customize controller, uh, well, the Helm controller would pretty much have an out, uh, uh, sorry, outbound HTTP or HTTPS to, to reach Helm repositories. Um, it doesn't have any inbound at all. Um, and that would be that. When it comes down to customized controller, it would be kind of similar. Uh, within customized, uh, customize, you have the concept of remote bases, uh, which, for example, would allow outbound for you know any ba a remote base you, you set up. So, but that would be pretty much HTTP or HTTPS. Um, I'm not sure we can. Yeah, I'm not sure what customize uh, supports there. I, I would assume it's both protocols. Um, and the same thing here, it doesn't really have a inbound um, uh, endpoint at all. Uh, when we go to notification uh, controller, then it gets a bit more interesting. Uh, you have outbound for any provider that the user is specified, right? So for example, um, these providers could be Slack, could be, Microsoft Teams can be like literally any communication platform that we support. Um, and then the inbound is that there's two endpoints really. So one is a webhook receiver, which is pretty much um, for you to, to receive from outside of the cluster notifications to trigger a reconciliation. So for example, imagine every time that something gets merged on GitHub, you want a reco reconciliation to, to be triggered, that would be the endpoint you use. The second one would be, if, um, we call it event uh, endpoint, which is for all the other controllers to communicate with notification controller to say, look, I tried to do this, it failed or it was successful. So then, you know, the notification controller can uh, push those notifications out to its uh, providers. Right. Um, Just a is... minor point of detail on the other controllers. Do you have metrics yeah. endpoints as well? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. So we do have uh, metrics endpoints and we have um, by default a PP, uh, P proof. Uh, endpoint as well across all the controllers uh, 
good good shout there. thank you uh, if I can, another comment on the previous controllers. I assume the, but yeah, bear in mind that I don't have the full picture of uh, how, how internet it works, but for the Helm controller and the customized controllers, I assume they are the ones doing the uh, reconciliation, right? Yes. So the, what about the communication to in-cluster reconciliation or like external clusters? I, I assume they are the ones doing outbound, right? Pretty much. So they will communicate with the API, uh, the cluster API server. Um, yeah, in both in cluster or externally as well. Yeah, if, it will be. It, I mean, the destination will always be an API server. It's either the same cluster or another cluster. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, good shout on that as well. Uh, it is on the. Let me open on my side here the the graph so I don't forget other things. <laughs> but good point. Brilliant. So we talked about most controllers. Now it's we're just missing the image controllers, right? So when it comes down to the image reflector controller, it goes outbound to Again, HTTPS and HTTP, HTTP uh, to to pretty much container registries, and then and then it will communicate. Well, all, in, in a way, all these controllers, right? They they would communicate with Kubernetes API because they they are responsible for reconciling a given object, right? So, you know, all the CRDs that are responsible uh, of. The only ones that apply changes to the actual cluster are only those two, Helm controller and customized controller. So just, just kind of highlight that. Um, so for the other ones would be only internal in cluster uh, Kubernetes API, I think. Yeah, we just need to highlight that. Um, all right. So that would be that for the Im uh, image reflector controller, we, we would have all those metrics, uh, B uh, uh, P-proof um, endpoint as well to get go metrics, um, and that would be that for the image reflector controller. For the image automation controller, uh, it would be similar to to the reflector, but without the outbound. Um, you know, we would have you know outbound for Kubernetes API and would have outbound. Well, actually, yeah, just that. Uh, then we have the metrics. We have the, the B proof. Let's be B proof. And we should be, we should be good there. Yeah. Sorry, I haven't heard of that. Is that, is that spelled correctly? And um, it's just, uh, oh, actually, I think it's just one oh, uh, B prof. Ah, uh, uh, P prof. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I'm, uh, no, I need another coffee today. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, and, and just two things as well. I think it might be worth just rephrasing a few things. So um, we have. For example, inbound and outbound ports, and we have like traffic, right? Um, so it would be good maybe to come call out the things that we have, like you know, inbound. So for example, the metrics and P proof would be inbound on all those uh, those guys. Yeah, understood. Um, does one of the image controllers? You mentioned one of the image controllers updates. Uh, the repository. So that is the automation controller, the one that you're dealing with right now. So that would be via HTTP, HTTPS, or SSH as well. Yeah. And in theory, from all the components, that's the only one that should have right access to to Git repository. Uh, another thing just to call out as well, we deal with sources 
uh, about different types of sources, but when we are updating with image automation controller, we only update Git repositories. Okay. Right, that's tremendously useful. Good job, everybody. Um, right, so for, for data storage there, um, I, I guess we're thinking... Yeah, so data storage, um, yeah, just kind of highlight quite quickly, we don't have any persistent storage as such, uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> um, but all the sources we, we we get, we fetch, we store locally in the source controller instance, which means every time that you know the pod dies, we go and we have to fetch all those um, all that information again, which can be a problem. Um, Unless users, for example, map a you know PVC uh, or, or some sort of like more uh, permanent storage. Um, apart from that, I guess we would say that it yeah. stores deployment state as a tag on the Git repo still, uh, but not inside of like flux at all well yeah okay so we would store the details of like tags of a container registry for example but that that is basically just on the status of the, the crd we have we, we don't really store uh, anything else apart from that i i guess we could invert the question and say if somebody wanted to tamper with Flux, where could they do it? And and if I, and this might be a Flux v1 thing that I've got wrong, but didn't Flux v1 update a tag on the branch that it was deploying, so it knew where it was in case of uh, restarts? I think v1 would, but v2 works uh, works differently. Uh, we, we have all these status of a given source on the CRD itself. Um, and then on each re reconciliation, we kind of start from a clean sheet and we, we try to kind of reconcile the whole uh, process. On your other uh, question around, if I was going to temper with data, where would I do it? Um, so given that the, the controllers that apply changes into the cluster have to call source controller, and that endpoint is, um, is not secured by TLS, I would probably try to do, you know, amend the middle there. I think that that would, that, that would be the, the easiest way um, around it um, and do it both with any component which has uh, next admin on, you know, on the node of that controller. Um, mm -hmm. Other things possible as well, which is quite interesting, right? So I I think I called out on the um, on the thread modeling the Kubernetes CV, which I don't think will be fixed, which is the twenty twenty eight five five four, right? And what that means is it allows folks to poison the DNS. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link here as well, so it's easier as well. Yeah, right. So what does that mean is that, for example, if you're on a multi-tenancy setup, you could have a tenant changing what github.com means and actually hijack that, uh, you know, redirect those uh, request to a given uh, part inside the cluster, well, service inside of the cluster. The only way that we have, you know, to protect those things is twofold, really. So one is the CA trust, which at the moment is 
is a bit, this is not great. We have an RFC on this, but basically every single um, CRD that you configure on Flux, for example, when you're configuring a Git repository or a bucket, you can define what CA you trust, right? And the same for SSH. So you can say, look, even though this is saying google.com, um, accept this self-signed certificate and that would fly. So those two things combined would be a problem. What we're trying to do on the RFC is pretty much block that by default. And, and is that is that when a tenant is that within the configuration file when a tenant defines a source or is that something that an administrator sets up when they set up flux for the first time on the on the cluster so at the moment is per crd so every source you define you can override okay. trust which is not ideal i will uh, let me just send you as well to refer to the new um the new rfc that which is exactly that topic, and it goes exactly to what you mentioned, which is an admin would set that instead. So that is that. Um, all the things that could happen, uh, especially around communications. So the notification controller is great to have response you know, quick response to anything going wrong, right? Uh, given those two problems, <laughs> so the, the notification controller endpoint is not secured by TLS and due to the CVE as well, uh, a tenant would be able to completely, you know, block communications going out uh, when it comes down to external providers and on internal communication from other controllers to notification controller, they they would be able to tap on the wire, right? Because it's it's being uh, passing uh, on plain text. Does that make sense? So the uh, is that sorry you were saying that the events endpoint is HTTP? Yes. So so pretty much all the the endpoints that we provide right now, they are only HTTP. When it comes down to the web book, as you're going to service that via ingress, that is not as much of a, of a problem. But the internal ones, you know, which is the events endpoint and the source hosting uh, would, would definitely be a, a problem. For the TLS on that, let me also share the RFC on this, which is to enable that by default. Users would be able, obviously, to add encryption with, you know, at CNI level, or or even put some some service mesh. But still, I think that that kind of thing should be handled uh, built-in. Uh, so you know, you don't need all those things. Sure. Okay. Uh, does does anyone else have any comments on kind of data storage? Because I I wonder, obviously the the CRD structure is important here as well in terms of what CRDs and and who can access them and building in the it, is that all namespaced? I I assume it's all namespaced for the perspective of segregating different tenants on the clusters and so forth. Yes, that's correct. So all the CRDs are namespaced. We don't. Uh, we don't store any sensitive information in the CRD themselves. We, we have quite a robust way of, you know, handling the state. So all that is pretty good. The only thing that I'm slightly, like, not, not really comfortable about is, is about the trust, which I already mentioned. Um, things such as credentials for sources, for example, they are, they are set as uh, Kubernetes secrets and and yeah, we we also have a, a mechanism of decrypting those secrets, especially if you have like on your repository, um, 
we have a mechanism of on-demand decryption during a re reconciliation, which means the secret never touches the disk. You kind of decrypt that. Why are you doing the, the reconciliation with SOPS, S-O-P-S, the Mozilla project? Um, you use the secret and, and then, you know, that's it. It's, it's gone. Okay, so if you're a tenant and you need to deploy a secret into your cluster, obviously you're not going to just have that in plain text in your secrets YAML file in your Git repo. So you you you've got support for SOPs. So so pretty much, yes. Yeah, cool. Okay. I'm trying to think about other sensitive information. Well, so other sensitive information we would have is for all those providers those communication providers we were talking about, so for example, Slack and so on, uh, the URL for them are treated as a secret because you have a token included in them, uh, but they are configured within Kubernetes secrets. And just to clarify that those credentials are read only for all sources except for Git, which is read write. Well, yes, when you mean, uh, well, actually, you, you touch a very interesting point that um, at the moment, you can't really, well, you could create two different sources. So, for example, you only need read-only access. That's what you need, right? Uh, but when folks are configuring source controller and image automation controller together, they tend to reuse a source, which means that the credentials provided to source controller might be read and write. But it's not a requirement. But maybe it's yeah, it's worth calling out. But everything else would be read-only. Uh, can I add another thing on this? Just uh, still on the hard multi-tenancy scenario. I guess another imp very important sensitive data is the cube config, right? When you are uh, in, a, in a hard multi-tenancy scenario where you are managing flux to through cluster API to spin up additional clusters, I guess the, uh, the, the cube config itself is uh, read-write and uh, very, yes, very that, sensitive, I would say. Yeah, th that would be an admin level. Uh you know, credential for to, to, to the remote cluster. And that is saved as a uh, cube secret as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at into the, when in the, in the presentation we had the other time, um, I can't remember the meeting, but I remember the hard multi tenancy scenario where someone mentioned the cluster API. So I guess that's where the secret will, uh, will come into place. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a Kubernetes secret, and and again, then it, it applies all the the same um, problems and <laughs> and characteristics of of Kubernetes secrets. Uh, but yeah. I agree with you that is is definitely quite a contentious point. I think it might be worth um, highlighting as well. I don't know where would be the best part for that, but especially when you're talking about multi tenancy. Um, so imagine. The controllers that apply changes, they are very powerful, right? Like they could be a cluster admin, for example. But for every single customization or Helm release you configure, you can also configure a service account, which will be used as an impersonation target that will then apply those changes. So, for example, if a tenant tries to do you know anything to privilege escalate, it will always be bound by the service account bound to, to that tenancy. Does that make sense? Yeah, it cool. does. It, it does. So I guess it's a good point. Not, not reading, not, not having not read the docs as a tenant or within my, uh, 
within my source, if I accidentally, I don't know, if I copy and paste something from uh, a different namespace, right, into my set of YAML files, and I accidentally forget to change the namespace to my own, what what controls are in place to to prevent that from happening? Is that the the concept of this this kind of yeah. service account? Yes, pretty much. So uh, so there are a few things we need to to bear in mind here. So. Uh, it's not a default behavior. We call, we call it a moot tenancy lockdown, um, and and that relies on on some sort of APA uh, OPA agent, uh, in which what you do is a few things. First, you force the controllers that apply changes to always uh, require service account, and if they don't, there would be def you know they would be uh, redirected to the default, which has no access at all. So if they try to deploy anything, instead of getting the controller permissions, they will get the default service account, which has no permissions, and will just fail. And then the tenant itself would need to provide a service account that you know, has the powers that it needs. So for example, namespace level, um, read and write. And, and then with that, the API server will actually enforce the RBAC NOS. Understood. Uh, just a question to clarify on this, because I've seen a comment, I mean, a comment added by Rowan here on uh, the, the requirement for open policy agent. I took a look at the RF, RFC, but I, I didn't, I didn't catch that. I mean, I looked at the functionality about like uh, uh, having these uh, sent service account permissions which are bound to the tenants, but to me it looked like it didn't need any additional tooling for for uh, for it to work. Is that correct, or uh, there is this requirement on uh, on OPA? Well, so my main concern that is how we structure a set of Kubernetes uh, objects in such a way that a, an application cannot privilege escalate. I'm gonna give an example. Within a namespace, anyone with great, um, great pod permission can pretty much bind that pod to any service account. If you're creating a service account, which has read and write across the namespace, it means that any application, in theory, could try to use that namespace, uh, use that service account, therefore privilege its escalating itself to get read and write access to the namespace. That's why you would need an OPA to, to say, okay, only these applications or only these pods, for example, would be able to be bound to that given service account. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay, now it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, an additional, uh, control required to uh, to avoid basically every pod in that namespace theoretically to to use the service account which would have i mean pretty much admin access to that uh, to that namespace so okay it, it makes exactly. sense yeah. yeah so alternatively another thing that could be used is something like you know a hierarchical uh, namespace uh, the hnc controller which then you would be able to kind of have different levels there within a given namespace uh, but otherwise like Either way, to have like a secured uh, approach to this, you you need one of the two, either OPA or some sort of um, you know other mitigation. Yeah, it makes sense. I I don't know if Andy has dropped, but I think we. Yeah, he just dropped. He said he had to go. Ah, okay. So I think we've kind of filled in this this discovery piece quite well, and and I I appreciate that the kind of the core of the discussion is around um, the multi tenancy uh, like isolation kind of domain. So aside from the concerns we've kind of teased out so far, are there any other areas that you think are you know, are particularly um, concerning 
um, and and I welcome I kind of welcome others to jump in if they have anything that they'd like to to ask about. Well, on, on my point of view, uh, and I try to kind of caveat my initial thread modeling with that, um, is that it is really, really challenging as any application to be able to say we are secure in a namespace as a service tenancy model. Like, it's, it's, it, there's just too many <laughs> variables there that could be a problem. Um, you know, um, one thing that is also problematic for us, especially on that case in which we um, reusing or sharing given um, flex components across tenants is that it's quite easy for one tenant to, to get greedy or get noisy. And, and that could, you know, make it those reconciliations from other tenants to not be uh, honored or, or have like a massive delay. Um, so there's definitely a few things on that that are not really greatly resolved. And I don't think this is just a flux problem. I think overall sharing components on, on a soft, soft multi tenancy or namespace as a service uh, multi tenancy is, is just really hard to, to tackle efficiently. But yeah, that, that is a major concern. Like we, we start thinking about options on sharding and so on. But again, it's, it's quite challenging because even if you think about resource consumption, you know, like you can't, as, as far as I'm aware anyway, you can't really uh, enforce C groups for a given reconciliation. So imagine, for example, you have four different tenants, same controller instance, and you'd be able to say, no, only 25% of my resources I want to spend on this reconciliation. Everything else I want available for the other uh, tenants. Like at, at the moment, you can't do that. So the only way we do this securely right now is with the hard mode tenancy, which is you need a you know uh, an instance for each tenant. Understood. Understood. I had a, a vague. Uh, may, maybe quite a high level question because I'm not fully kind of familiar with it, but within within um, in terms of the SOPs usage for tenants, I, I mean, I, I presume that I mean, just from skimming the docs in the background, I mean that 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 clearly relies on some kind of requ requires on a uh, sorry relies on on a usage of keys for encryption yeah. or decryption of those. And, and I presume you're able to, that that's kind of segregated between tenants or is it something that is kind of controlled at the admin level and everyone just gets a common um, Yeah, you, you have both. Key for encryption? So you, 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 you could have pretty much both, right? You can configure either GPG keys, which in this case, for example, especially if it's the first customization that you're talking about, then it needs to be injected in the cluster doing provisioning. Um, but everything else you could, or, or even, you know, for example, if you have an, a KMS solution in the cloud, um, you would be able to have uh, isolation per tenant and, and, get, and get credentials that are specific to that tenant um, to access a, Tenant specific KMS. So, yeah, th those things are, are in place. Okay. Kind of open the floor if anyone else has any 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 thoughts or questions at this time yeah i have a question going back to the to the to the to, to my previous question which was regarding the uh, service accounts bounds to specific tenants in a, like in a soft multi-tenancy scenario uh, i was wondering uh, is it possible or is it restricted for a um, 
let's say, for a specific namespace to reference service account that's outside of the namespace, like service account, which maybe has cluster roles, allowing access to two different namespace, namespaces. Is it uh, uh, feasible or uh, is there some, something which is allows that? No, we, we only have in cluster, we, we can only refer to a service account that is in the same namespace as the okay. Flux object um, on that case. R really good question. Um, so on that, we, we are safe. Obviously, that service account could have cluster level or cluster wide permissions. Uh, but then that that's kind of beyond our control. Uh, but on that train of thought, as part of our lockdown tenancy, we have um, we we block access to cross namespaces flux objects. For example, when you configure a source, you define a secret and so on, right? So if you're using this source. In different places, you don't need to have access to the secret. You only have access to the, you know, source directly. If you are allowed to access a source that you haven't defined or that is defined to a namespace you don't have access to or shouldn't have access to, that means that you bypass the need of knowing that those credentials. So, on a lockdown mode, you would not be able to pretty much go there and tenant A refer to a source defined by tenant B. Uh, and the same thing goes to notifications, right? Because a, an alert could be created to say any issues that I have with a given source or reconciliation, I want to pass this on to you know, my, my response team. If you can do cross namespace references, you would be able, for example, to hijack notifications from another tenant. That's why it's so important this uh, lockdown, uh, multi tenancy lockdown. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. Also, on this, is this lockdown kind of a safe default when you enable multi tenancy? Like I, when, when I say multi tenancy now, I mean the soft multi tenancy, so like the namespace level. Is it kind of a default or you need to? To be aware that you, maybe you have to, I don't know, to do some configuration changes on your controllers in order to, to enable that. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not a default. Um, so the deployment is pretty much the same across any type of deployment model. Uh, so when users want to deploy that, you know, securely on a soft tenancy, a uh, multi tenancy, they would need to look up for that information and, and adjust accordingly. On our examples on how to do multi-tenancy, we show that proactively, mm. but it's, it's not a default, unfortunately. But uh, just uh, this is just a <laughs> I'm thinking out loud question. This is no, really it's... important if you are talking about like a soft multi-tenancy, right? Because if we are talking about multi-tenancy, then uh, I assume this lockdown isn't really that important because you you actually have cluster level access to the in the tenant yeah. right yeah so the tenant will have his own cluster so okay they don't exactly need, that's that's you don't exactly have a problem with cross uh, yeah cross tenant resources you shouldn't so so when we're talking about you know especially fleet management you would have a top cluster which has references to the bootstrapping of all the other clusters and then each one of those clusters would have their own uh, flux instance with you know cluster wide permissions and and so on so you know they, they're pretty much protected on that perspective the the main um, the main issue is if the you know the man management cluster gets compromised then you know all the clusters are compromised but I, I, I don't know there's a way to to kind of protect against that um, but yeah, so th these things is definitely just for soft mode tendency. I, I, another question on this, now that you mentioned this, uh, but maybe this is, a, this is a bigger problem or a bigger question. Uh, in our multi-tenancy mode, uh, um, who's responsible of deploying the flux instances on the, let's say, the, the tenant clusters? Because, okay, you have this management cluster with its own flux. Okay, there is a, I don't know, platform team managing that. But when you spin up a new cluster through Cluster API, the new Flux instance for the specific cluster is, is like centrally managed by 
the flux in the management cluster or, did, or you actually need to, I don't know, bootstrap that as if it was like a new cluster and uh, it has no relationship with the management one? Well, so it, again, the, the great thing about Flux is that you have different components and everything's quite flexible. So you pretty much can mix and match whatever deployment model uh, you want. What folks generally do, especially in, co in enterprise companies that require high level of like kind of templates and, and things need to, to follow a given blueprint, what you have is this management cluster then that kicks off, let's say, you know, Terraform or whatever to create these other clusters. And then the flux from that management cluster would apply the flux deployments of each one of these other clusters. For example, limiting access uh, or defining specific, you know, like OPA agents that need to be running. Like it, it can pretty much install things to a level in, in, in which is safe for a tenant to kind of do whatever they want but like all the the, the safeguards would be in place if you if you know what i mean so that is definitely like a kind of best practice on on like big management i would say okay Uh, another question on this, now that you are, uh, well, this is actually just asking, asking more information. Uh, right. Let's talk about like, I mean, in the, in the standard way of flux uh, without multi-tenancy, uh, when you do the reconciliation, I assume this is done probably through a kind of cluster admin uh, role binding, I assume by the, the controller responsible for reconciliation, right? Yeah, by default, yes. Yeah. Okay, so when we are talking multi-tenancy, soft multi-tenancy. So we are talking having uh, separate service accounts for the different namespaces. Uh, is this, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the imp impersonation, right? Yeah. So I, su I assume the reconciler will uh, impersonate the different service accounts, but uh, does the reconciler have still uh, high privileges like cluster admin or is it restricted to only the impersonation of specific service accounts? Because I, I assume you could have this uh, different level, right? Because if you are just using for multi-tenancy, then maybe you don't need to have uh, cluster admin for reconciliation. You, you you only have specific admins for the individual namespaces. Is that correct or? Uh, yeah, it, so am you I can that. Totally. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it, it does make sense completely what, what you're saying. Uh, and we strive to only rely on the impersonation. Um, there are uh, some specific um, controller runtime issues though that uh, goes a bit beyond. So, you know, you can't rely 100% just on impersonation because caching, for example, is something that, to, you know, as, as, as far as I remember, it needs to happen at the controller um, permission level. So whatever you have at the controller level would be used for the caching. So for example, for caching, objects that the controller might need to access. Um, I think there is an open issue about this, trying to kind of mitigate it. Um, but for most operations and definitely all the right operations, they will be bound by the impersonalized, uh, you know, the, the service account set for impersonation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, thinking about this privilege, I think it makes sense because if you are delegating that to the individual service accounts, probably you don't need to have at least the right access. I'm, I'm not I'm not talking about like cluster wide read access, but maybe cluster wide right access isn't that needed from the reconciled point of view once you are impersonating other service accounts. That's correct. So the, the only caveat on that is that the controller will always need impersonation rights, which means it could impersonate any account unless you have some sort of, you know, rules to block, you know, specific accounts for it to be to impersonate. So in a way, it's like it is least privileged, but it can be 
highly privileged anytime yeah, yeah, it wants. can just es yeah. escalate to yeah to another service account which has yeah that's where maybe opa or other tools like that might be of of help in thinking about like restricting the i don't know yeah. like whatever you can i mean the actual service accounts you can you can impersonate by only restricting to the flux service accounts and not like any other account in yeah. the in the cluster completely agree and and that's why you know it's so important for example when you're doing fleet management that you kind of think about those things and you constrain those tenants because ultimately you know flux is reconciling state it, you know it, it can create things to kind of privilege escalate itself especially when you mm -hmm. think about, about like a host level and and so on um so those things need to be thought through like properly <laughs> to make sure that's as safe as as it could be for uh, tenancy use yeah appreciate it i appreciate we're coming to time i just wondered if anyone else had any kind of any quick questions or anything um anything of note i had i had one i had one kind of final question slash suggestion which is does flux do any kind of self self state or configuration reporting via like the event or via the notification controller. Because one of the things you could do to highlight to, to end users is if you've got things that are maybe not as well locked down as you or as you you'd hoped, or, or you know, something like lockdown node not, not being enabled, using that event stream to just I don't know, periodically report this is the yeah. state of your flux deployment, here's the config. Yeah, we definitely Lockdown don't have mode that. Lockdown is not enabled. Yeah, we don't have that at all. Uh, the only thing we notify on is the state of not, you know, reconciliation. So, for example, if you're trying to source, yeah. uh, well, get a source and you fail because uh, you don't have the access, uh, or if you successfully manage to do something after failures, but we don't say anything, we don't show anything around uh, security features or state it was just an idea i, I don't yeah. know how useful it is or how feasible it would be to, to implement but maybe it would be something to help end users because I, you know, yeah these things are up and running and and you know working uh yeah they, they may forget i completely agree uh to be honest we started thinking about ways to well, at least define those rules, you know, like what does best practices from a security standpoint, you know, like what, what does that look like? Uh, so we started thinking about that and we want to pull down the flux CLI. Um, but ideally, when you're doing GitOps, you don't really have direct access to the cluster. So your idea on that would kind of actually match that uh, quite well in, in terms of not, have, not needing direct access to the cluster. Okay. Uh appreciate it if there are if there are no other comments uh i thank you so much for your time it's been hugely enlightening uh, and it's been a, a big learning process for us as we kind of trial this this new template uh, as well um we'll formalize the the kind of write-up and then and the reply i guess within within the thread uh the sorry the github issue to make things nice and clean with with some recommendations and a summary uh aside mm -hmm. aside from that i Thank Amazing. you very much. And thanks no, thank everyone. Thank you for, guys. <laughs> it's been really good. Been really, yeah, it's been a been a fun discussion. Awesome. Thank you very much. See you guys later. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you all.